We are truly blessed in the community to have remarkable teachers, and it is a tribute to the rabbi's spirit and strength and his influence that so many are willing, able to come and to share with us. Tonight, Brad Artson, a longtime friend of this community and a longtime friend of Rabbi Schulweis, dean of the Ziegler School, and uh, one of the great, one of the great minds of the community. Thank you. Thank you. You have to speak right into the mic, and you're tall, and we're not used to that here, so. What a metzia, tall Jews. <laughs> there you go. Malka. It's customary to ask permission when you speak in front of your master and in front of his family. Um, just thank you for allowing me to give voice. So you've heard discussion about Rabbi Shulweis, many of you for your whole lives. And this is the house that he built. These are the houses that he's built. I can't add to that. What I'd like to speak about tonight is how he went in my life from being Rabbi Schulweis to being Harold. <laughs> Which wasn't easy for either of us. So the first time I met Rabbi Schulweis, uh, my mother-in-law was a Hebrew teacher here, Chaya Shavit, and um, they were members of another valley synagogue, which they loved very much, but every now and then they would sneak out for a treat because they said, you've never heard preaching until you've heard a Shulweis sermon. So they brought me to hear a Shulweis sermon. And, and, and here's what I discovered. I discovered that a Shulweis sermon is actually three sermons. You could actually hear him rev up, make a point, and then start to take it in for a landing. And then, as you were about to reach for the Sidur and thinking, good, now we're going to have Kiddush. No, no, no. He would rev it up again. And at some point in this series of revving up and almost landing and taking off again, he would always, at some point in the sermon, bring up a German word that I swear to God he made up. And he would say the word that no one in the audience knew, and he knew that none of you knew what the word meant, and he knew that you knew that he knew that no one knew what the word meant, and that's what made it so delicious. He would get this grin on his face, never translate it, and then move on. And those were the three best sermons I think I had ever heard. He was electric, because what you knew in his presence was he was authentic. Who you saw was who he was. He couldn't help himself. Sometimes it would have been better if he had been someone else, but he couldn't. He was authentically grounded in who he was. And who he was was far more than just a great mind, although there has never been greater. He was an integrated heart. He knew that thinking is not abstract cognition. It was the engagement and the integration of the mind and the heart. And, and that was clear the first time I heard him speak. This man is the real thing. Which also means, and I want to say something that has not been said publicly about him, but it's worth in our age saying. It meant that at the end of that sermon, I knew this was someone I could learn from because he would insist on authenticity in his presence. It also meant this was someone I could trust. There has never been any questions about this man's integrity in a long and glorious rabbinic career, let that be noted. Let that be noted. Okay, so that's, that's my Rabbi Shoah's number one. He also ended the service with Israeli dancing. 
And you can imagine my panic. I had just applied to rabbinical school at the time, and I found myself dancing next to and being gripped in the hand of Harold Schulweis. Any of you who have had the pleasure of, remember when there was Israeli dancing after services? I don't know if you still do that, but that was a big thing, right? Um, if you were dancing next to him, you didn't finish dancing until he finished dancing. <laughs> because as, as it says in the VBS bylaws, when the rabbi dances, Dancing a la Hasidim. <laughs> Number one story. Number two. Okay, so a couple years pass. I have survived rabbinical school. Thank you, God. And I am now a rabbi in a small, exciting congregation in a bedroom, bedroom community known as Mission Viejo, which for a brief moment sparkled with Torah. And. <laughs> I am also an integrated person who will tell you the truth. <laughs> so, so I had to fly somewhere for something, I don't remember what, and so I drove up to LA and I parked in the long-term parking lot and it was three in the morning. I don't, I don't normally see mornings. So three in the morning and I get on the van to take me there and who's sitting in the front of the bus? Rabbi Schulweis, who is holding a book that is a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> I don't know what book, it, it, looked, it reeked of boring, it just like from far away, it was intimidating and boring. It may have been a book of abstract German terms, for all I know. <laughs> so I, I waited for him to look up so we could, you know, make eye contact. And I kept waiting and waiting and waiting, and it finally got to whatever airline he was going to, and he just got up and left the bus. And I realized, this is a man who wakes up for deep thought. And that was true. I remember I had a practice of calling him on a regular basis, and you felt like you were interrupting a graduate seminar. It would take him 20 minutes to remember to say, how are you, Brad? Right? Because we would launch into whatever idea he was aflame with at the moment. But again, there was something so exciting about someone who didn't distinguish between here's what I do for a living and here's what I get excited about. He was just passionate about possibilities, passionate about seeing things that no one else had ever seen, and which, frankly, once he saw it and translated it for the rest of us, then everyone else spent a decade imitating. Okay, so that was story number two. It wasn't the highlight of our social engagement. <laughs> I drove up from Mission Viejo to meet with the great rabbi. I sat in his office, and I said to him, Rabbi Schulweis, now that I'm in Southern California and I come from a family of not religious Jews, I really need a mentor. And so I would like for you to be my mentor because I've now read your books and, and I love your books and I love your thinking and I think we have in many ways kindred souls and I would like you to be my mentor. And he said to me, no. <laughs> I schlepped up from Mission Viejo for this. No, he said. At some point, you have to mentor yourself. Okay. I drove home in a very bad mood. <laughs> but there are two things that I realized in the years since then. The first is, he was of course absolutely right. One of the ways we stop being authentic is we put the responsibility for our own choices on someone else's lap a rabbi, a therapist, an artist, whoever, we find someone to say, you make all of my choices. And then, you're not you, you're them. Doesn't work. But the irony is, in giving me that answer, and then always being available for my phone calls, always being available for my lunches, you know what he became? <laughs> ha, so there, Harold. <laughs> he became my friend. He became my friend, as I know he is for so many of you, too. He became someone who I could carry on about my children. He never did that. 
never. He would talk about his love for his family and how it kept him going. He did talk about you. Um, and I'm sure others have commented on this. I just feel like I need to say it too. I am part of a power rabbi couple. And I know that in those couples, it's never the rabbi who's actually the power. <laughs> and in your case, Malka, that's saying a lot because he was, after all, Harold Schulweis. But he spoke of you with me with love and reverence and sincere admiration down to his core. And I know that everyone in this room feels the same about you. So thank you for you in all of this. Um, okay, so, so the last piece that I want to share about, about Harold Schulweis is something I've never heard anyone say about him. You've probably said it, because you, you are his Talmid Mufchak. And... Um, he also would speak about you, Eddie, with tremendous affection and respect and thrill at what you were doing, moving this place in places that he could only dream about that you bring to reality. Um, everyone talks about how he's a disciple of Kaplan, and, and he was. Um, but he was actually a Hasid. And here's how I know that he's a Hasid. The teaching of, of Rabbi Schulweis that I quote more than any other teaching is a teaching that he links to you, Elisa. He talks about sitting on your bed and you wanting to know where is God. And if you haven't heard this story, shame on you. Um, how do we know there's a God I can't see God, and I can't touch God. And he said, I'm going to get the details wrong, so I apologize. And he said, can you touch my elbow? And she did. Can you touch my shoulder? And she did. And he said, can you touch my love? She said, I can't touch your love. Well, then how do you know that it's real? And she said, I know it because I can feel it. It turns out you're a chassid too. The Hasidic masters teach there are some things in the world that we can only see with our eyes open. Buildings, budgets, membership lists, those are things we see with our eyes open. But the really important things in the world, those things we see with our eyes closed. We see loved ones who are no longer with us physically, and we feel them. And we see what a better tomorrow might look like. Well, it turns out that's a Hasidic teaching that I learned through my Hasidic master, Harold Schulweis. His passion, his energy, his infectious laugh, his inability to be serious when other people were being pompous, his ability to dissect an idea and to take a complicated idea and whittle it down so that we could grasp it, his ability to remind us when other people were retiring to Parcheesi or Miami or the kind of retirement I hope to have, and he wakes up and says, I think I'm going to save Africa which then, of course, becomes a huge imposition on all of us. <laughs> For us, there's a reality we only see with our eyes closed. You can close your eyes, and you can see that beautiful smile and that great big cranium and his enthusiasm, and his vision, and his dancing, and his whirling a community into life. But he, if he were here, would tell you, open your eyes. You're not a Shulweisian if you think that the ultimate reality is only accessible when you close your eyes. The reason you close your eyes 
is to remember what to make it look like when you open your eyes. And that is his legacy to all of us. Please welcome Craig Taubman. Thanks, Rabbi. Brad, I only have six stories. I actually have three stories. I have three stories. The first one is when I met Rabbi Schulweis. The first one is when I met Rabbi Schulweis here. I was a 15, 16-year-old kid. I was, at, uh, I was a kid at Sinai Temple when Gila's father was the rabbi, Hillel Silverman. And I remember vividly Rabbi Silverman coming up to me and saying, you're really good. And that meant the world to me as a 15-year-old kid because he was the great Rabbi Silverman. And then I came to Valley Beth Shalom. And your husband said, you're really good. <laughs> and I remember it as a 50-something-year-old man. I remember the second thing at Eddie, your mom's funeral. I was sitting outside and there were tons of people and your husband was talking. And he said some word and Eddie said, is that even a word? And your husband said, it is now. <laughs> and the third thing I remember is sitting with him a couple of months ago and him challenging me. He said, the so I had written a song based on a lyric that he wrote. And he said, you have to stick the word spine in there. Spine, S-P-I-N-E. And uh, how do you put spine into a lyric? But if you look at Rabbi Schulweis, and he was never Harold to me, not even close. He was never Harold to me. He was Rabbi Schulweis. He had spine. He had back. And he had your back. And I'm not saying, I'm, I know he had, he had to have, I don't know your relationship, but he must have had your back. But he had back and he had spine. As the last lights of Hanukkah are lit, we're reminded that the light of hope lives on. And our world's a little darker because of his absence. For some of us, a lot darker. Or Zaru Alat Sadiq, light is sown for those who are righteous. So this is a song for Rabbi Shoais. Or Zaru Alat Sadiq, U Yishrelev Simcha. Ozaru ala tzadik uyish relev simcha. Ozaru ala tzadik uyish relev simcha. Ozaru ala tzadik. U Yishrele Simcha. Your part goes like this. Yalaba. Yalaba. Let me teach it first. Yalaba. This is one more time. Yalaba. Yalaba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yourself. singing keep on singing or zaru wala sadi u yishwele simha or zaru wala sadi u yishwele simha this way all of our voice let's fill it up just this group I said, think not what is a Jew, but what ought a Jew to be. Not what is a synagogue, but what ought a synagogue be. Not what is a mourner, but what a mourner ought to be. Not what is human, but what is ought a human be. What is a singer without singers to join? Last time, last time, chazak, chazak, strong. Yamama Yam 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 I knew Yamama 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 Last time last time Orzaru Ala tzadik u yishwele simchah.